And I think somehow that gives him a sort of confidence. And a confidence in me as a friend. And as an example of somebody who's made it. Mm -hmm. You, what is your idea of making it? Hanging in. Staying alive. Being there. Being here. Being aware. Being in touch. And enjoying life. Having a relish for life. Passion. I want to talk about men. <laughs> I have to talk about men. Now all the tabloids say that there's this thing going on with it. Actually, let me just tell you this. I never believe anything I read in tabloids. Good. So much so that when I was um, in L.A. a while back and I saw you and George Hamilton at a restaurant, I mean, I, I was just stunned <laughs> because I said it's actually true. I know, because all for, I mean, I've been seeing it passing the Walgreens counter for, and I just, I mean, I don't even like even acknowledge it. And I said, it's true. It's <laughs> really true. So um, I got on the phone, called everybody I knew. <laughs> um, and now, now I saw uh, a picture of you and, and Malcolm Forbes and you were on, on a Harley Davidson purple. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So what's the deal? My hog. Your hog. What is the deal? What is the deal? Malcolm and I have uh, biking buddies. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's true. And it stops right there on the bike? Well, we go out in a hot air balloon once in a while. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're so revealing. You just tell everything. I declare. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You got to stop talking so much. Ms. This Taylor. is what your friends wanted, right? <laughs> you have just got to stop telling everything you know. <laughs> so, okay, let's just, just go down there. George Hamilton, what, what, is that just a special friendship? Yes. No kissy kissy. Why, you cheeky bugger. <laughs> I just want to know, just tell me so we can all go home, man. We can all go home. If you tell me, I'll go home. Well, I think George and I have broken up. But, I, I mean, I, we're friends. Okay. And so now it is really Malcolm or none of my business? None of your business. Okay, I thought so. Malcolm and I are buddies and we go biking and ballooning and um, boating and we're buddies. I believe that. I, I think that's really wonderful. I, I really do. That's he's nice. he's great fun. Mm -hmm. Are men intimidated by you? I think men are not so intimidated by me as they are by my fame. I think that can be very intimidating to a man when they feel like they're going out with an institution rather than a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, and to get over that first how do you diffuse that? How do you try? Takes a man with a great deal of uh, self knowledge, um, confidence. So, um, how, when you're going out with someone new, whom you really like, are you like um, a, a little? Do you a little um, teenage girl getting? Do you think about what am I going to wear? How am I going to well, do my course. hair? Of okay. course. I just wondered. I'm abroad. I mean, I do the same things you do. Mm -hmm. You're not abroad. You're a woman, child. You're just a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, how'd you get to this point? What point? Of this sense of... Because what exudes from you now, more so than anything other than passion, um, is an inner peace, which no matter how diamond, many diamonds, Krupp, Cartier, or otherwise, you have. You cannot buy that. Oh, they don't give you peace. At all? No. So the sense of inner peace that you have, did it come from or begin with your stay at the Betty Ford Center? Is that what triggered this? A lot of it. Mm -hmm. Silence. 
and my mouth sort of opened as if I were about to gasp for air, and that I didn't say anything for about two hours, except, please leave me alone for a couple of hours. It has to be my decision. May I gently ask for just a piece of, of your memory of what was it that hurt especially? Did, did a child, one of your children say something that you didn't realize you would hurt them? Or what oh, is the, it? I think the uh, guilt that I had caused my children such pain. Like what? Being late or not being shut no, up? No. Or... Um, that they worried so much about me whether I would survive or not. Um, so that they'd have to help pick me up off the floor after I'd taken sleeping pills on top of booze. How much pain I could see in their faces. And I had caused that. I'd inflicted that. And it killed me. You were taking Valium, sleeping pills, and Jack Daniel. All at once? I didn't get drunk. It would be after I'd taken the sleeping pills, the mixture of the sleeping pills and the booze, and then I'd go zonk. So you were never a sloppy kind of... No, no one ever drunk. saw me drunk because uh, I had like hollow legs. And it would be after I'd taken the sleeping pills, a lethal combination. It's a wonder I didn't kill myself. Why do you think you didn't? Well, I took one precaution. I obviously didn't want to die. Um, I would lay out, like in the evening, the amount of sleeping pills and Valium that I would take that night. And if they were gone, I knew I'd swallowed them. And I wouldn't say, oh, <laughs> you know. I, so you kept your I own inventory, your audit then? Yeah. To ensure you didn't double dose and... It, which is how people die so, uh, um, frequently. You know, the accidental uh -huh. suicidal death. When did you do this, in the morning? Uh, before I go out or in the evening, before I was too stoned or sloshed. Mm -hmm. So there was something in me that wanted to survive. And then at the Betty Ford Clinic, you walked into your cottage. No flowers. No welcome, Elizabeth Taylor, we love you. No paparazzi. You had to cry about that, didn't you? Had well, I've never been so lonely in my life. They were all in a meeting or something. And I arrived at nighttime, and usually um, one of the other patients greets a newcomer and takes them to their room and shows them where to unpack and where to put the clothes and all that. There are two beds in each room. But they were all away someplace, and I was going to detox down there, and I was waiting for the nurse to arrive, and it was like two hours that I sat in this room without anyone to talk to or cry out to or anybody to touch or touch me and finally I had visions of nurse ratchet arriving and stringing me up cuckoo's nurse yeah and finally this darling girl arrived and we became best friends and she was with me for 10 days and she was showing she's great she's one of my best friends and you got up on one occasion and you said I'm Elizabeth Taylor and I'm an addict and then after so many times of doing this, one day you stood up and you said, I'm Elizabeth Taylor, I'm an addict and an alcoholic. Why is that a significant difference? I mean, because you... Because you, I finally admitted to myself at that moment that I also was an alcoholic. Michael Todd and Richard Burton get special treatment in your book. No one reading this book can come away without believing that those were the greatest memories of your life. Do I understand uh, what you were intended to say to your readers? Uh, I imagine it does come out that way. <laughs> You're not comfortable, however, uh, talking about it. Um, and yet, once again, we have Elizabeth Stalwart not only having divorced Richard, and taken all the hits that the public, that the press and the gossip columnists have to offer, but you went to work with him in private lives. Not that only, was not easy. Well, he was seeing his new lady. Yeah, that, that was, uh, that wasn't easy. And it was not successful. It was certainly not.